to be here. Uh, I come in peace for all mankind so uh, and womankind as well, if I may dare to represent them. Uh, the way I thought I would structure the, the thing is uh, basically read a, a bit from my new book, which I hope then establishes my credentials as uh, an authentic UFO witness and possible abductee. And then I'll talk a little bit about what I think about it, because I don't think about it what most people think about it. My dream from the time I was eight or nine was to encounter a UFO, because I always had the impression that if you would encounter one, you could understand it. That it was maddening to realize that it seemed to have a great affinity for people who lived in trailer courts, but very little affinity for anybody I knew. And so you constantly had to filter these eyewitness reports by people that you wouldn't send to the corner store to buy milk. So this was a problem, and it will haunt, I'm sure it haunts many of you who have never encountered a UFO. So I'll read the description of the encounter, then talk a little bit about my conclusions and ideas about it, and then we can just uh, have a discussion. I guess I should say a little bit about my method. I really am a fence sitter. I love science. And I'm always keen to attack it in most situations, though not here, because I love reason, and I'm perfectly aware of the difference. I also know what, it, what uh, a concept means like rules of evidence. I'm not sure that's a concept uh, as widely circulated in these circles as it needs to be. In other words, how do you tell shit from Shinola? That's very critical. Um, and I'm, uh, I think reason can take us only a certain distance. And then we have to go with the divine imagination, but with all safety systems fully in operation, or the divine imagination will lead us into complete paranoia. This is what happens to a body of knowledge when it's unable to make good on its first premises. In other words, if you have a great notion of reality, but you can't confirm it, then it must be because evil forces are conspiring against you and somehow subverting the success of your neat version of reality. And as someone who at one point in my life studied the history of science, there have been many episodes in the history of science where great hope gave way to paranoia. The phlogiston uh, phenomenon is one example or more, uh, Lysenko and genetics. And, you know, it's been, what, 47 years since the Rainier lights are close to it. And the phenomenon has not become more explicit. The hysteria has become more explicit and has wandered first in one direction and then another. But if this is a contact, it's the most peculiarly uncontact-like contact it's possible to imagine. It's always, it reminds me of people say of the crop circles, you know, they're communicating. Yes, but if they are, they picked an incredibly obscure medium in which to do it because we who love communication can glean very little from what they're trying to say. Well, enough barn beating. Uh, <clears throat> let me um, read this passage and then I'll talk more about it. And this will bring, I think, the, uh, the thing into focus. I have to introduce the context because it wasn't like 
that we just happen to be driving in a lonely and remote place and suddenly, uh, no, it wasn't like that. We were in the center of the Amazon basin. We had come there uh, to explore tryptamine hallucinogens. These are short-acting, very powerful psychedelic drugs. And the reason we were so interested in these drugs is because in encounters with it in the pure chemical form, it was invari the intoxication was invariably characterized by encounters with elves, gnomes, fairies, thousands of these things. And this was, uh, and this is something I'm going to, um, you know, try and convince the UFO community of what we drug people have that you don't is repeatability. And the scientists always said to you UFO people, what you don't have is repeatability. They don't want to even talk to us. Uh, but it is true that, that when you smoke DMT, for example, at a sufficiently high and prepared dose, you get elves. Everybody does. Uh, you may not believe it, but on the other hand, it only takes five minutes to prove that I'm bullshitting you 100%. Surely anyone who's studied the UFOs and alien intelligence for as many years as the people represented here have can afford to invest 10 minutes in the wild-eyed assertion that all you need to do is inhale deeply three times and, you know, you want contact, you want elves, you want alien intelligence, you'll have it up the kazoo. <laughs> now, of course, it comes from an unsanctioned dimension, but I'll talk more about that after the reading. I, uh, so here we were in the Amazon basin, uh, experimenting with mushrooms, and uh, here is the passage. So, all night long, I sat reviewing the things that had passed, seeming to divide my consciousness and send it both backward through my family tree and forward into the future. I seemed to see all the years still ahead. I saw some technique emerging from this contact, our careers pursued across time and space, and finally vindication as the world realized the truth of the transdimensional nature of the Stropharia visions and the true nearness of the worlds that they had thrown open. For it had become my belief that the contact with an intelligent and utterly alien species was beginning for humanity. It seemed that out of the long night of cosmic time, the novelty of novelties, the moment of contact between minds on utterly different planes was beginning. We were among the first to achieve contact with this other. It was the real thing. We had come to the equatorial jungle to explore the dimensions glimpsed in tryptamine ecstasy. And there, in the darkness of the heart of the Amazon, we had been found and touched by this bizarre and ancient life form that was now awakening to the global potential of a symbiotic relationship with technical humanity. All night long, strange vistas and insights poured through me. I saw gigantic machineries and worlds of vegetable and mechanical forms on scales inconceivably vast. Time, agatized and glittering, seemed to pour by me like living superfluids, inhabiting dream regions of terrible pressure and super cold. And I saw the plan, the mighty plan, at last. It was an ecstasy, an ecstasis that lasted hours and placed the seal of completion on all of my previous life. At the end, I felt reborn, but as what, I knew not. In the gray light of a false dawn, and I should say I wasn't loaded, I was insomniac. In the gray light of a false dawn, the wave of internal imagery faded away. I rose from where I had been sitting for hours and stretched. The sky was clear, but it was still very early, and stars were still shining dimly in the west. 
in the southeast, the direction toward which my attention had been focused, the sky was clear except for a line of fog or ground mist lying parallel to the horizon, only a few feet above the treetops on the other side of the river, perhaps a half mile away. As I stretched and stood up on the flat stone where I had been sitting, I noticed that the line of fog seemed to have grown darker and now seemed to be churning or rolling in place. I watched very carefully as the rolling line of darkening mist split into two parts, and each of these smaller clouds also divided apart. It took only a minute or so for these changes to be executed, and I was now looking at four lens-shaped clouds of the same size, lying in a row and slightly above the horizon, only a half mile or so like a tornado or a water spout and it flashed into my mind perhaps it was a water spout something I still have never seen but even as the thought formed I heard a high-pitched ululating whine whee, 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 come drifting over the jungle treetops obviously from the direction of the thing I was watching I turned and gave one glance at the river house 70 feet behind me and up the steep hill, gauging whether I had time to run and awaken someone to get confirmation of what was happening. To arouse someone, I would have had to go hand over hand up the slope and consequently take my eyes off the thing I was watching. In the space of an instant, I decided that I could not cease observing. I tried to shout, but no sound came from my fear-constricted throat. The siren sound was rapidly gaining pitch, and in fact, everything seemed to be speeding up. The moving cloud was definitely growing rapidly larger, moving straight toward the place where I was. I felt my legs turn to water and sat down, shaking terribly. For the first time, I really believed all that had happened to us, and I knew that the flying compressors was now about to take me. Its details seemed to solidify as it approached. Then it passed directly overhead at an altitude of about 200 feet, banked steeply upward, and was lost from sight over the edge of the slope behind me. In the last moment before it was lost, I completely threw open my senses to it and saw it very clearly. It was a saucer-shaped machine, rotating slowly with unobtrusive, soft, blue and orange lights. As it passed over me, I could see symmetrical indentations on the underside. It was making the wee-wee-wee sound of science fiction flying saucers. My emotions were all in a jumble. At first I was terrified, but the moment I knew that whatever was in the sky was not going to take me, I felt disappointment. I was amazed and I was trying to remember what I had seen as clear as possible. Was it me in the naive sanction that that question is asked with new clothes and tables and chairs? No one else saw this thing as far as I know. I alone was its observer. I believe that had there been other 
curiously, this last point can be interpreted in my favor. I am familiar by direct experience with every known class of hallucinogen. What I saw that morning did not fall into any of the categories of hallucinated imagery I am familiar with. Yet also against my testimony is the inevitable incongruous detail that seems to render the entire incident absurd. It is that, as the saucer passed overhead, I saw it clearly enough to judge that it was identical with the UFO with three half spheres on its underside that appears in an infamous photo by George Adamski, widely assumed to be a hoax. I had not closely followed the matter, but I accepted the expert opinion that what Adamski had photographed was a rigged up end cap of a 1937 Hoover vacuum cleaner. But I saw this same object in the sky above La Chirera. Was it a fact picked up as a boyhood UFO enthusiast? Something as easily picked out of my mind as other memories seem to have been? My stereotyped but already debunked notion of a UFO suddenly appears in the sky by appearing in a form that casts doubt on itself. It achieves a more complete cognitive dissonance than if its seeming alienness were completely convincing. It was, if you ask me, and there is no one else really that you can ask, either a holographic image of a technological perfection impossible on Earth today, or it was the manifestation of a something, which in that instance chose to begin as mist end as machine, but which could have appeared in any form, a manifestation of a humorous something's omniscient control over the world of form and matter. And I flash forward two paragraphs. In the previous paragraph, I had been discussing mirages, and I said an ordinary mirage is something that we see in space that isn't there. Could there be mirages in time? In other words, could there be reflections of distant technologies that haunt space the way images of distant cities haunt uh, our time haunt space? I believe that this latter comes close to the mark. The UFO is a reflection of a future event that promises humanity's eventual mastery over time, space, and matter. We, in our clumsy attempt to probe these mysteries, we, meaning my brother and myself, uh, were able to coax nature into throwing out this great burning scintilla of pure contradiction from the dark retort where she labors over the chemistry of the millennium. That we were able to do this is full of import. It meant to me that we were on the right track. The Stropharia Cubensis mushroom is a memory bank of galactic history. Alien, but full of promise, it throws open a potential for understanding that will sweep away the petty concerns of Earth and history-bound humanity. So that was uh, the encounter, not the only encounter. The book is full of weird shit. But that is uh, actually, in a sense, the most conventional presentation of the encounter. It was absolutely convincing. It was the Adamski gift, which I do believe is malarkey. It was as cognitively dissonant as it could possibly be, you see. Because if it were convincing in its alienness, you would know what you were dealing with. A UFO from another star system, obviously. But what are we to make of a 45-foot diameter Hoover end cap uh, uh, sailing through the blue skies of the Amazon? Uh, well, I've given a lot of thought 
to these questions because my method has always been rational. In other words, I hear about something weird and I go there and I say, what can you show me? What have you got? I applied this to yogins in India, UFOs, fairy sightings, reason, but a willingness to explore the edges has been the method. And when I applied that method to the spiritual traditions of uh, mystical India, I came away with uh, <clears throat> considerable skepticism as to their accomplishments in that domain, at least in the contemporary scene. Uh, I have never seen a violation of physics that was not connected somehow with a psychedelic experience. My entry into psychedelics began very naively. It was presented as instant psychotherapy or insight, however vaguely defined. What I discovered when you make your way through these chemical families is that not all psychedelics are alike. And this very small family of compounds called the tryptamine hallucinogens bear careful examination if we're seriously interested in this question of extraterrestrial penetration of the human world. On two grounds, immediately, the mushroom bears looking at the first argument entirely a physical argument. Psilocybin is for phosphoryloxy, NN dimethyltryptamine. What this means is, is that there is a phosphorus group substituted at the four position of the molecule. Now, here's the headline, folks. This is the only four phosphorylated indole on this planet on this planet now if you were searching for extraterrestrial thumbprints on the biology of earth you would look for molecules that are unique that cannot don't have near relatives spread through other life forms in psilocybin, we have a perfect example of this. It is the only four phosphorylated indole known to occur in nature. Nature doesn't work like that, folks. Nature builds always on what has previously been accomplished. So this is a red flag saying at the molecular level, this thing looks like an alien artifact at the molecular level. Now, let's cut to the chase. What happens when you take 30 milligrams of this stuff? I don't know how sophisticated this audience is. People who have never taken hallucinogenic drugs but have some mild interest in it or just in the course of generally educating yourself about reality, I think people who have never taken psychedelics think that it's sort of like dreaming while you're awake or ge geometric patterns, colors, they always say, the colors, the colors, malarkey, the colors, forget the colors. It is not like that. Psychedelic experiences at effective doses, not piddling doses, effective doses, are visionary scenarios. They are three-dimensional unfoldments of information that is extraordinarily complex, architectonically connected, and ordered. That's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about what is unique to psilocybin. What is unique to psilocybin is that overlaid over what I just described is, big surprise, a voice. A voice. Everybody knows this who has to do with this stuff. Gordon Wasson, Richard Schultes, Albert Hoffman. The giants know that this stuff is animate. This is not a drug. It's something which is disguising itself as a drug. 
in order not to spread alarm. There is a voice which speaks to you in the language of your homeland, whether that be Mazatecan or English. And the voice surprises you. In other words, you cannot anticipate it. Now, of course, at this point, though I don't imagine many of them have forced their way in here, the psychological school will come forward and say, well, it's a voice uh, typical of uh, mental aberration, symptom one of schizophrenia, a voice. Yes, yes, we are not naive. We read, we went to the same schools you did, thank you. However, uh, the fact that this voice is accessible to non-pathological personalities and on demand is highly suggestive, I think. Next point, ah, but let me belabor the point. This experience is available to everyone. The thing I love about psychedelics is no guru, no method, no teacher. You don't need any of that crap. This will work. If it doesn't work the first time, you didn't take enough. This will work. It will work on you, Mr. MIT engineer, with your diagrams of antimatter propulsion systems. It will work on anybody. I started out from that place. Uh, okay, that's the first thing. Now, this small family of compounds, of which psilocybin is an interesting example because it occurs in the mushroom. And let me say this, uh, my workshop will do a mile uh, <clears throat> What troubles me about the, Uf the current state of UFO modeling is how incredibly pedestrian the alien is assumed to be. I mean, their little gray suits, their charmingly slanted eyes, their cheerful interest in our reproductive capacity. I mean, I think that the alien will be so alien that your jaw will hang in the air. And expecting to meet an anthropoid-like alien with an interest in your reproductive machinery and gross industrial capacity is as culture-bound a concept as searching NGC 321 for a good Italian restaurant. It's absurd on the face of it. Let us for a moment hypothesize aliens. Somebody, the guy before me spoke of being a hundred thousand years in advance. If you want to know how far in advance you are, if you're a hundred thousand years in advance, ask yourself, where were we a hundred thousand years ago? And I think you see the, the gap is, is, uh, is very large. If we are in fact being penetrated by a non-human intelligence, that presumably somehow, perhaps not physically, but perhaps physically, can cross from star to star, then we are dealing with something vastly more sophisticated than ourselves. That's just given at the get-go. Well, if it's vastly more advanced than we are, then DNA sequencing, uh, complete understanding of the molecular genesis of thought, so forth and so on, would be no problem for that level of technical sophistication. You would also like to think that ethics and good taste would keep pace with this evolutionary process. So to my mind, the idea of fleets of alien spacecraft filling the skies of Earth, that's as unsubtle as kicking down somebody's front door with an M1 tank to announce, we're here. I don't think you would do it that way. If you really wanted to study a aboriginal race and you really had a hot technology, what you would do is you would study their social psychology and you would say, are there any chinks in the armor of their expectations about how reality behaves. 
and you would discover in studying us, this species intoxicates itself and it has a curious attitude towards its intoxication. Anything goes. So if somebody drinks a pint of Stolichnaya and announces that they see pink elephants, we are all amused. We say, of course you do, you were drunk out of your mind. Isn't it obvious that an alien would hide its presence in an intoxication? that this is the non-invasive, tasteful, respectful way to have intercourse with another species. You say, you put yourself into a plant, you put a barcode into a molecule, then the shaman intoxicates himself and he says, aha, it's an ancestor spirit or it's the soul of the plant. But whatever it is, it's giving me good information. It's telling me where the reindeer went. It's telling me what the weather will be next week. It's telling me who stole the goose, and it's telling me who slept with who, and it's telling me who among the ill members of my tribe will live and who will die. And with that information, I can make a political career as a healer. So you see, the extraterrestrial is a mean trader. The extraterrestrial is trading data, giving data, maybe, but I think trading because it's taking something away. So first it tells you where the reindeer have gone and who's sleeping with who. Later it suggests things like alphabets. Later still, it suggests things like the calculus. Do you see where it's leading? All of human history is the signifier of the presence of the alien. Human history is what happens to an advanced animal species when it is interpenetrated on a scale of a million years by a mind in another dimension. We were selected out of the swift running river of animal organization, took an orthogonal turn and headed out into the world of symbolic activity, cognition, signification, ritual, analysis, projection. The flying saucers, the alien, the other, is what is sculpting us out of animal organization as we move toward it in time. This is what shamanism is all about. This is what the psychedelic people are discovering as they descend into these trances. Well, okay, well, one more thing and then I'll leave that given the interests of this crowd. Mushrooms cannot be found in the fossil record older than 40 million years. You say, ask a straight paleontologist why, and he says it's because they're soft-bodied and none survived older than that. We have soft-bodied creatures in the Burgess Shale that are dating out at 3.8 billion years. If you assume a super technology it means that the species that holds that technology can design itself. It is not subject to the tyranny of whatever form it inherits from the evolutionary processes of its home planet. Even we in our primitive state are on the brink of being able to design ourselves uh, through genetic manipulation. Therefore, look at Stropharia tubensis the psychedelic mushroom. Spores are the most uh, electron-dense organic material known. The electron density of the outer case of a spore approaches that of a metal. A single mushroom in the sporulation phase can shed up to three million spores a minute for up to six weeks. One mushroom. 
maintain following Bracewell that in a strategy for extraterrestrial contact carried on by a super technology would take the following form. Build a probe. Give the probe the ability to replicate itself. Start these probes out from your home planet and at every, say every half a U or something, the probe replicates so that the volume of probes stays constant as the volume of space increases. If you're carrying out an exhaustive search of the galaxy for life, it's very hard to imagine a civilization that could visit every star and monitor every star over long periods of time. A much more efficient strategy would be the phone home strategy. You send essentially a credit card which says if you get this message call the enclosed toll-free number and immediately report your location we will come at that point that's I think what's going on human history is the effort to phone home human history is the effort to decode a message in the terrestrial environment of this planet that shamans and dreamers and mystics and let's throw in a few schizophrenics and out and out screwballs have been accessing for millennia and it's not new it's very very old and uh, it cannot be without significance that the Mayan civilization which used these mushrooms became obsessed with 2012 AD I, who am absolutely phobic of obsessions in all forms, am myself obsessed by December 21st, 2012 AD. That's the bottom line of the barcode. And my, my notion of what's going on in the informational phase space of contemporary existence is that we are under the influence of a kind of attractor this is this thing I mentioned which seized hold of us as a higher animal and steered us toward language, ritual, religion, the calculus, so forth and so on. Uh, this attractor is literally sucking the world of three-dimensional space and time into itself. This is what history is. History is biological time turning into some other kind of time. History is speeding up as we approach the Omega point. And here is a granted idiotic, but nevertheless serviceable metaphor for how this thing at the end of time works and why we are driven so nutty by things like flying saucers. The transcendental attractor at the end of the historical process, think of it like a, one of those mirrored bar balls that hang in a disco that catch the light and put scintillations on the walls as it spins around. As we approach the transcendental object at the end of time, the reflections, the precursive anticipations what Wordsworth called the intimations of immortality grow ever stronger. The world is becoming more and more irrational, more and more fraught with anomaly. Uh, you know, not only flying saucers, but Bigfoot and the crop circles, which are quite new as a wrinkle. There will be more and more of this stuff as we approach the moment of concrescence. And people in the past, Christ, Buddha, you name them, these are people who literally stood in a correct geometrical relationship to the transcendental object at the end of time. But it was just dumb luck, that's all. They were not superior people. I'm sure that if you could enter into the mind of Christ as he went around Galilee performing his miracles, the main thing which preoccupied his inner circumlocution was the question, why me? You know, what's happening? 
why am I compelled to do and say these things? Well, the, the, the uh, answer is you've got eschatological fever. You've been infected by a retrovirus that operates not in space, but in time. And to the degree that one can clear themselves of the momentum of past presupposition, the transcendental object at the end of time actually comes into view. Plato said time is the moving image of eternity. The way I think of shamanism and psychedelic voyaging is that it is trans-dimensional travel, literally, not in some, not, not in the undefined way that you often hear it used, but in the mathematical sense. A shaman and a psychedelic person and a UFO contactee is someone who has seen the end. They simply didn't know what they were looking at because who knows what the end looks like. The, the world of historical possibility concresses into a mercurial hologrammatic disk, part bios, part machine, part syntax, part mind. The categories dissolve. The world is not what it appears to be. I was very interested in uh, I, I, I was very interested in coming to this thing and studying the psychology of the group and it was very fascinating to me that both of the speakers where I listened to the whole thing were very concerned to refute the psychological explanation which I gather is the Antichrist around here. Uh, and as I understand it, somebody said to me, the first thing they said to me, I thought, my God, these people are on end. He said, I want you to know that this Jungian thing is bullshit. I said, okay, uh, that's fine. Um, however, this is like beating a dead horse. Has the news from quantum physics not reached the UFO community? Is it not now thoroughly assimilated that an observer is necessary for reality to exist at all it's all psychological there's no distinction and so these people who have such enthusiasm for beryllium ships from our tourists or wherever should be informed you know same same that's important news it is now, and where is it coming from? Let's, let's not rush past this here. Physics has always been the paradigmatic science. All sciences have physics in Why is that? Because it's not unlikely in a physics experiment to be able to predict an experimental result to three decimal points of accuracy. So, that's science. You don't get that in sociology. You don't get that in psychology. You don't even get that in biology. And, and physics is the most mathematical of all the sciences. So around the towering edifice of physics, the more frightened and uncertain of the sciences had gathered near her skirts. Well, so now what is physics telling us? Saying, uh, folks, uh, hold your horses here. It turns out the cheerful world of uh, billiard ball-like atoms winging their way through Newtonian space is in for serious revision. It turns out that these particles aren't even particles. They're waves. Well, no, not exactly. They're both. Well, what I actually meant to say was, and you discover 
that's the babble of mad people. Science has collapsed. Its core has given way to contradiction. The cheerful exploration of matter that begins with the Greeks is destroyed by Werner Heisenberg and all his evil grandchildren who now show that, you know, number one, it's incomprehensible, number two, it's self-contradictory, number three, you can't uh, conceptualize it except in some enormously complicated mathematical phase space anyway. So this concern for the materiality of the saucers is a completely anachronistic issue carried far enough the analysis of this stage will show you that it has no quote reality to it. Now this plays nicely right into my hands. Let's go back now to those drug induced hallucinations. You know, I think every every UFO investigator in the country, uh, they have these uh, forms when they come rushing out to your house when you report an 11 mile long green cigars overhead. And the first question is, are you intoxicated? Do you have a history of taking drugs? What is your relationship to altered states? This is a complete fascism. Most encounters with extraterrestrials take place in altered states. That's what altered states are. Reality is, you know, the tip of an iceberg of irrationality that we've managed to drag ourselves up onto for a few panting moments before we slip back into the sea of the unreal. What this means then, just to cut to the chase, is that um, psychedelic drugs are as important to the study of UFOs as the telescope was to the redefining of astronomy. You can meet the alien. You can meet the alien tomorrow night if your connections are good enough and you can meet the alien over and over and over again you said this was what you wanted baby it's on its way it's being served uh, the anxiety that society feels about psychedelic drugs and notice, psychedelic drugs do not cause addiction, ruin lives, or inspire people to rob banks or any of that. Psychedelic drugs, nothing has ever been adduced against them except that they give you funny ideas. Well, I think this is a crowd familiar with being stigmatized for dealing in funny ideas. They haven't made UFOs illegal but they certainly have made psychedelics illegal. This is because this is the portal. The secret is out. It isn't going to be a top-down revelation. It isn't going to come on McNeil Lehrer or the cover of Time. There will not be an announcement from the White House press office. Anybody who has that vision of how it works has completely given away their own power. You are not to be a consumer of the UFO. It is not for your amusement. It is for your transformation. And you can play the game of waiting with the uninitiated. Or you can simply go look at the end of the movie. Shamans have been doing this for at least uh, probably a hundred thousand years. And it's a, it's a process of opening to an experience, not an ideology. It's not an ideology. It's an experience. The UFO thing began as an experience. The Rainier life, the rest of it. It was quickly seized upon by ideologues, the contactees of the 50s. Now there are new ideologues. The problem is everybody claims too much information. 
You know, I mean, where does it end? Uh, people who have uh, exact information on the geography of Atlantis or the pecking orders of distant planets and this sort of thing. I mean, there are rules of evidence. There are rules of evidence. And uh, what can't pass through that filter has to be discarded. I think that the real other need not be guarded by the frail efforts of a cult apologist. The real other can be hammered on with a ball-peen hammer and it will do just fine, thank you. So I want to suggest, and I'm very delighted to have the opportunity, the UFO community has a great database of experience with weirdness. Now you need to just take it uh, one vibratory level over and cut your teeth on what we've been putting up with for years, which is these alien entities that are so easily contacted and dealt with through the intercession of the psilocybin and DMT family of compounds. Uh, I want to describe my DMT experience just to let you know how alien it is, and then we can discuss this a little. I described the psilocybin experience, or I mentioned that it is a voice. DMT, which is a near relative of psilocybin, psilocybin I mentioned for what happens to me there is a mandalic pattern which forms which is identifiable as what pharmacologists call preliminary hypnagogia it just simply means that the brain mind system is saying yes exotic indoles are arriving at the synaptic receptors in unexpected numbers yes we are monitoring this situation yes 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 okay that goes on for about 30 seconds and then you are propelled through it into a place a place not a state of mind a place and this place has its low it's no higher than the ceiling and it's actually about the size of this room but rounded solid light indirect light uh, but the main action is you are instantly plunged into an environment of elf intelligence self-transforming machine elf i call these things or type just for want of a better thing they are not cheerfully portrayed and suitable material for t-shirts and coffee mugs they are self-transforming jewel basketball like things it's not clear they are made of matter, they are made of life. Their status on the phylogeny of biology is extraordinarily murky. Uh, and they come pounding forward like badly trained dogs, cheering. They say, here you are. You may all recall that, you may recall that old being confronted by these entities and one of the things they do that's quite disconcerting is they come jumping up or dribbling up to you and then they will sort of vibrate in place then they jump into your chest then they jump back out but the main thing is they are doing 
something very, very interesting. What they're doing is they, I call, the reason I call them language elves is because they possess an ontos of language that is completely alien to us. They use a language which you can see. They can condense meaning before your very eyes. For them, syntax is not acoustical rules, it's pictorial rules. And they are doing this. They will scramble forward, elbowing each other, jumping up and down, very excited. And they say, look at this, look at this. And they pull objects, sing objects into existence and show them to. And as your attention goes into these things, you, you are, it's, the emotion is indescribable. These objects are made of gold, ivory, smaragdine, chalcedony, beryllium, terbium, flesh, gold, blood, heat, tears. And it's all changing, morphing as you look at it. And as you look at it, you have without an iota of doubt the conviction if I could bring this thing across, it would end human history. Argument would cease. You would just say, look, look at this. And they're pushing each other away, showing you, look at this one, look at this one. These objects themselves emit sound and make other objects. The whole thing is going on in an atmosphere of incredible hilarity and confusion. It's now one minute since you left your scuzzy friends in that badly furnished apartment. Naturally, this, this have, the fact that you're having this experience raises certain fundamental questions, such as, am I dead now? Is that what's happened? And the entities say, they say, don't give way to amazement. Don't flip out about how you can't believe it and it's impossible and so forth. But don't do that. Just pay attention. Pay attention to what we are doing and what we are showing. And what they preach is a new dispensation of language. A language that can be beheld. And as you sit there, you feel like a bubble form in your stomach can begin to make its way to your mouth. And when it comes out as a kind of a glossolalia, you discover that in that space, you too can make jeweled objects with spinning interiors and reflexively rotating sub-themes and so forth and so on, all driven by a kind of spontaneous glossolalia-like verbal uh, activity that is very spontaneous and undescribable but fortunately doable. It sounds like this. This is a pictorial activity. Now, when I went to the Amazon, I discovered, I didn't discover, I went to, they've been known for years, tribes of people using a hallucinogen called ayahuasca. And when you take ayahuasca with these people, they sing. And then they have like little intermissions. And I would be in my horrible Spanish ear listening to these people. The guy next to me is saying to the guy next to him about the song, he says, I love the olive drab part. But when he got into that thing with the silver on magenta, I just thought it was tacky. And I'm what? Say what? You realize these people, for them, sound is being transduced in the visual cortex. The ordinary processing of acoustical input is being shunted to the visual cortex. This is the same thing the DMT types are talking about. And these are the very jungle tribes that it's always been charged had group mind 
telepathy, ways of creating a social cohesion that was contravened reason. This is what's going on, I think. Now, uh, I then studied this phenomenon of language very carefully. I mean, it had never even occurred to me as visual language. I discovered, however, that nature has anticipated this phenomenon in the organisms that are known to us as octopi and cephalopods. As you all know, as you're probably graduates of those horrible nature specials on TV, octopi can change color. Most people think this is camouflage. It isn't camouflage. It is language. Octopi control an enormous repertoire of what are called traveling dots, blushes, shading, striping, wavy lines, and a huge color palette. These uh, exterior changes on the surface of the octopus are a direct readout of its state of mind. It wears its mind on its surface. And you may not know, but it's the third gastrulation of the blastopore in the human fetus the, it becomes the surface of the body. The surface of the body is brain tissue, essentially, a very thin sheet of brain tissue all over the outside of the body. That's why there's so many nerves in the skin. So what seems to be being preached in the DMT encounter is the ontological transformation of, into a telepathic mode. Now, you may have thought telepathy was you hearing somebody else think. Apparently, that's not what telepathy is. Telepathy is you seeing what somebody else means. It's the visual acquisition of meaning rather than the audio acquisition of meaning because there is no ambiguity. You see, we use local languages. If your dictionary matches my dictionary, you can understand me. And that's fine if we're saying, you know, could you close the door or get me a grant? But if what we're saying, if we're talking about the ontology of language or the political obligations to the community in the light of the inevitability of mortality or something like that, then acoustically transduced sound and common dictionaries don't cut the mustard. One of the most uncool things you can say in any situation is, would you please explain to me what I just said? Because that rends the fabric and we're then faced in the mud of the fact that nobody understands or even bothers to listen to anybody else and if they do they don't get it anyway. Well, I, I think that uh, we are on the collision course with a planet transforming event and that we have been for a very, very long time. I also believe that it lies below the horizon of rational apprehension at this point in time. It's, it's, if you're in this game for fun, there's lots of fun to be had. If you're in this game for final answers, I suggest you take up geometry. Uh, it will be much more satisfying. There isn't going to be closure. I mean, because after all, don't lose sight of the fact that we're advanced monkeys of some sort. The idea that advanced monkeys could in fact unearth and then cognize the secret of the universe it's like expecting the same thing from termites or, or, you know, muscles. It's absurd. It's ridiculous. I mean, we are embedded in mystery. Our brains were evolved to keep us from being eaten by nearby hungry competitors. It is not a tool for philosophy. Uh, philosophy comes later. And uh, I, I think that what the UFO community and what the psychedelic community share is a tremendous impatience with uh, science, scientism and the fascism 
of scientism. And the way to overcome these things is to simply opt out of the historical game and avail yourselves of the shamanic tools which have always been there. The uh, whisperings from the other dimension are probably a thousand millennia old. That's a million years. That's the time that we have been sitting around campfires, spinning yarns for each other, and looking up at the night sky. We are not alone on this planet. But it may be that we are the late evolving intelligence. But the mushroom sent to me once, uh, it said, I said, what are you doing here? It said, you're a mushroom, you look cheap. I said, but it, it said, it, it was not such a bad neighborhood till the monkeys went berserk. And that was only yesterday. So you see, it isn't that they're coming to us from the stars, it's that we are finally having the scales fall, fall from our eyes to realize what it means to be on a water-heavy 